So let me repeat that. I hope you can all see um, what I'm uh, writing and that you can hear. Yeah, it works. Very good. Uh, so today um, we continue uh, with the object I introduced yesterday. And I would like to uh, kind of tell a little bit about how gauge theories arise uh, naturally from these non cumulative spaces that we talked about. So, this is the same slide essentially as yesterday to just get started to see where we are. Um, so, let's, uh, and, and actually, what I try to do is give as many examples as possible so that you kind of get a feeling and you can connect to, uh, to your, your favorite uh, example or your favorite corner uh, of applications. So, let me repeat this. Let me get rid of this. Yeah. Okay. So here is the definition I ended um, with yesterday, which is this notion of a spectral triple, um, where uh, that's a triple of data. A is a star algebra. So it's just uh, an algebra, meaning you can multiply, you can add, and the star means that there is some kind of uh, involution. So it's, it's, it's some sort of conjugation that you can apply to the elements in the algebra, uh, which is anti-linear and also it's, it satisfies a suitable property for the ordering, but I will come back to that in the examples. Um, they act as bounded operators on a Hilbert space H, and then there is this essentially self-joint operator D on a suitable domain uh, in H. Now then there are two conditions. Um, that is that the commutator of D with A extends to a bounded operator on the open space. And uh, furthermore, this, this resolvent one plus D squared to the minus one is compact. So it's a compact operator and that tells me something about the eigenvalues, um, how they behave, especially that the eigenvalues of D, they actually go to infinity. They have to go to infinity in infinite dimensional case. There's uh, several extensions of this definition. Um, there can be a grading so that the Hilbert space is, uh, is graded as Hilbert space and there's some compatibility of the other ingredients. There can be a real structure, which means that actually that would bring us from spin C to spin in the example I explained yesterday. But for now, for these lectures, it's completely sufficient to just think about this kind of um, naked spectral triple, if you wish. Where you just have a h and d all right so um let's give an example well the first one i already told you but it's good to keep that in mind because it's the motivating example it's c infinity of m l2 of the spinner bundle and dm on a Riemannian spin c manifold m comma g spin c so that was the example I, uh, I started with yesterday. And uh, we also saw that that actually gives rise to a spectral triple where these, um, or for instance, I mean, the, if you think about the circle, uh, let's just give an example of these analytical properties. On the circle, you find that the, the, the eigenvalues of this Dirac operator, they're just the integers. And that's actually the kind of the, the idea of a spectrum. It sits uh, as a discrete set in, on the real line and it accumulates at infinity, but nowhere else. All right, so uh, another class of examples, there um, well, they could be considered as a special case of this, but they're kind of trivial, but they're of interest in their own right. So they're finite spaces. And actually I would like to have uh, some kind of geometry on it. So let me start with what I just have a finite space. I just have some, points end points say and uh, to capture a geometric structure on this uh, it's it's like giving a metric which doesn't need to be the discrete metric it could be any uh, metric on this and the idea is to try to capture this which just a triple so let's see what happens and then we can also do the reconstruction in more details so what it gives you it gives rise to first of all so let's think for a moment what it means to be a smooth function on a finite space. And uh, while well, smooth is actually um, an empty state, an empty condition. So it means that I need a function from these points to C. So this means that C infinity of X is just CN. So these are just the 
the kind of the values that the, the function takes at these endpoints. So there's just an n-dimensional vector space. Uh, well, to think about spinners, it's, it's also not very difficult. You just realize that at each point you have some complex number that's actually sufficient. And then, well, on that CN, um, let, let's just think about the most general possibility. So I need an essentially self-joint operator on CN. Well, that's a lot of words to just say that's an Hermitian matrix. So something like D dagger is D. And in fact, all these other conditions of boundedness and so on, they're trivially satisfied because I'm in the finite dimensional situation. So um, this compact resolvent, this is of course, that's an empty statement for uh, an empty condition for uh, the finite dimensional case. So I have this Hermitian matrix and what is actually possible is not only con to construct this from X, but to actually get any metric on X can be obtained from such a, from such a construction. And it may be possible or, or maybe uh, necessary to actually make this Hilbert space bigger. So I don't go into the details of that. You can read that, uh, for instance, in the first part of my book where I do this, but let's give an, uh, an example of this. So let's consider n is equal to two. And let's see what happens is that, uh, so what I need is I, I have two points and I just need to kind of tell you what the distance is between the two. And let's look at the, um, the object I get. So the spectral triple on this two point space, that's, that's just something like this. And C is a complex number. And there could be diagonal elements in D as well, but actually they don't uh, matter too much because for instance, in the commutator, they will just, uh, the commutator with the elements in the algebra, they will not be relevant at all. So this means that if I compute the distance the, between point one and point two, so let's, let me write it down. It's the supremum of A in C2, and then it's A of uh, one minus A of two with the condition <coughs> that the commutator of this D with A is more or equal to one. And then what you can actually uh, just do as a little computation, it's an illustrative uh, exercise is that this commutator, it just, um, it, it boils down to kind of the, um, the value of A at one times this, this, this number C minus A2. And there is some 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 other component which is uh, maybe just to be this is C times A one minus A two. So that is the computation of this this commutator here. The norm of the commutator is equal to that. And then what you realize is that if I take the supremum over all such A, I have this kind of bound of this A one minus A two by one over the absolute value of C. So this is actually the distance between these two points. In this case, you can actually compute this supremum uh, and you find it to be one over the uh, absolute value of C. So this means that the Dirac operator or this finite uh, matrix D that I wrote here, it is the way to encode the metric in a very kind of concrete manner now in this case of, of two point spaces. Okay, so. I will now continue to uh, non-cumulative spaces. Um, and again, uh, as yesterday, please stop me if there are questions. Uh, so. so, finite non-cumulative spaces. Now it gets more interesting. And that's also kind of the, the link to these matrix models that were uh, mentioned uh, also in the other uh, talk that they're actually at the basis of this other uh, uh, theme of this workshop is now you look at block diagonal matrices instead of CN. So remember that this CN, I mean, there were like uh, the values that the function took in the previous uh, example at these endpoints. Now, what I will do is, I mean, since this is, uh, that's commutative, I can make this non-commutative by assigning matrices to each of these points of fixed size. 
So let's say um, N1 to N N. So that that A1 is of uh, is a matrix of size N1, etc. And then what you find is that first of all this is an algebra because you can multiply these matrices; they will respect this uh, this structure that we have over there. And also um, there's a star, and that's just given by a Hamishian conjugation of the matrix. So this means that my AF, let me call it like that. So that's uh, kind of the finite dimensional uh, star algebra that I associate to this is MNC, MN1C up to N. So that's an N, N dimensional matrices with complex entries. And <clears throat> this can act on um, a vector space V. So it's a C vector space. With an inner product, so there's an inner product uh, space structure on that, and these uh, are actually this V can decompose. I mean, it should decompose into irreducible representations of all these block uh, diagonal or block matrices, and then again, DF is nothing but a Hermitian matrix. which is fixed. So for this AF, you look at all such matrices, but this DF is a fixed emission matrix. And um, they will actually form, I mean, even though they're rather simple, they will form the kind of key uh, example for these um, the spaces that appear in the particle physics applications that, um, that can be described, but not uh, in this, uh, this conference. I will, uh, I will touch uh, them though. So let's uh, look at an example of this situation. So that's young males, that's the young males example. And what you do is you actually take just one single point in your algebra, that's M and C. And then H, young males, I would just label them by this. This is um, CN. And then D is some Hermitian matrix of dimension N, so it should act on this CN. So, That's just something to, to specify. And then you look at all these elements in this algebra that act on this Hilbert space CN and all the conditions of bounded commutators of compact resolvement, they're trivially satisfied because we're in the finite dimensional case. So I will uh, slowly work towards um, kind of explaining why we could call this young males, or why we should, um, but uh, that, that, that will come when I explain how to derive like invariance, unitary transformations, and uh, gauge fields in this context. Another example, which is the standard model, supposed to describe the standard model, then you actually take a different size and you also allow for uh, real algebras. So this is C plus H, the quaternions, was M3C and the quaternions here do not play the same role as the one uh, I explained yesterday where it arises as, uh, as clear for the algebras. Here's just an uh, ingredient to describe the non-commutativity of these kind of three points that we have. And they come with this internal kind of structure. Here's really just a point. Here's the internal structure of that second point is described by the quaternions, which is indeed a non-commutative star algebra uh, over the real numbers. And M3C is kind of the internal structure of this, uh, this third point. And one should kind of uh, think about this as this C describing the U1 uh, hypercharge. H is supposed to correspond to kind of the weak interaction, so the SU2 component. M3C, that's the uh, SU3 component of the standard model. So that's kind of, uh, if you're familiar with this, if you know a little bit of particle physics, then that's what's, uh, what's going on, what we're trying to describe here. The standard model Hilbert space, then you have to think about how many uh, fermionic degrees of freedom the standard model has, and that's actually 96. It's counting uh, um, kind of uh, there's particles, antiparticles, there's left and right, then there's leptons, and then there's quarks, and the quarks come in three colors. So if you do that computation, you get to 96. I will not uh, specify this more. And uh, D. That's a matrix that is kind of <clears throat> as, as, as components 
you test the, the mass or the Yukawa couplings of the standard model. So it's kind of packed into this spectral triple, all the kind of uh, the ingredients of the standard model. Um, so the particle content can indeed be described like this, and it allows to connect to uh, particle physics phenomenology. And again, one has to use uh, uh, an action functional that I will describe only on Thursday. Um, there is an extension that uh, that is also kind of in fashion. Um, is is beyond the standard model and can go in several directions, but this is beyond the scope of this uh, mini course. Uh, I would like to do one uh, combination of these two. So there are like A C manifolds. So it's, it combines something that you know on a Riemannian spin C manifold with these finite non commutative spaces. And it's supposed to be like a product of M times a finite space. And that's a non commutative uh, space, but it's finite. And the combination arises as a sort of a tensor product like this. So you take this, this C infinity of M, but you combine it with this AF. So these matrices, they are now like the values you take at each point of M. So it's like matrix valued functions. It's L2 uh, of SM tensor HF. And then here is slightly more complicated DM tensor one plus the grading that you actually have to use here. So that's why this is also beyond the scope since I didn't introduce this grading, but that's the one I alluded to before. There could be a grading gamma M uh, on a manifold M that you use in this product. And this is supposed to describe, and it, this formula actually works uh, for products of manifolds. That's how you get to kind of products of Dirac operator. And um, this works for finite spaces, finite non commutative spaces. And it, it's somehow like at each point, you have this internal degrees of freedom captured by this finite set of data. So this AF, HF, and DF, so this finite um, uh, set of data that describes the internal space at each point. And there, of course, kind of the combination you, you're after if you want to describe uh, gauge fields on a manifold background. And that's uh, what one gets in this, uh, from these uh, AC manifolds. AC stands for almost commutative, but it's also uh, a tribute to Alain Kahn. Um, so that's um, that's sort of the kind of the, the, the set of examples I, I would like to keep in mind. You see here that the non commutativity is uh, rather mild. So we have matrix products. So it's like linear algebra that one has to do, and that's the that's the kind of the non commutativity that we that you get. But so let me give one example of um, of something which at least one of the uh, organizers of this uh, workshop uh, uh, really uh, would appreciate. I guess is that um, if you look at more serious non commutativity, then one also gets an interesting example and that's when you uh, take um not so much like a commutative manifold and at each point some non-commutativity but you could also try to deform the manifold and and introduce some kind of uh, deformation deformed products on c infinity m so of course on c infinity m we take the pointwise products and um, so that's 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 giving me my um, my algebra structure, the pointwise addition. So that's what we have, but we deform it in something which is f star of theta and g of p. And so that means that the c infinity of m as a vector space remains the same, but you try and you try to kind of deform the product in such a way that you get some non commutativity built in. And the key example, I would say, in this context and in this uh, in this workshop, would be the um, the Moyal plane. And in fact, what you do there is is it's like with quantum mechanics, you try to deform. So what you do is, um, let me do this in um, x mu x nu coordinates. And what you do is you have these coordinates uh, on 
uh, R4, but you, you kind of promote them to operators that satisfy like a Heisenberg relation, which you may know from quantum physics. Uh, but now I take uh, kind of a more general uh, structure for that, where the X mu and X nu, they satisfy the anti-commutation relation with the I theta mu nu, where this is an anti-symmetric a real matrix. And these now are operators that satisfy that Heisenberg relation. So it's possible to make sense of this. And uh, of course, uh, here there's this, a subtlety that these X mu and X nu are unbounded. I mean, they have to be unbounded. Um, this can be, uh, this is not so difficult to see actually. Um, and that's the same argument as in quantum physics. But one can construct something which is a C infinity of R, uh, let's say D, deformed with this matrix theta. And it can act in a deformed way on L2 of spinors on RD. Well, that's just a trivial bundle. And then D of RD. And that actually this package uh, is shown just to also be a spectral triple. There's also grading and real structure if you wish, but for now it's important to keep this in mind that it's possible to kind of to deform the algebra, um, but keep the Hilbert space and the, the rock operator intact and then still have the structure of a spectral triple. So this was known uh, for, for some time. I can give you references if you wish, um, but there's um, other results uh, that, uh, that probably Reimar Wokenar is also very familiar with, so it might be easier to talk to him, even though I'm always available for, for questions of this type. Sorry, may I have a question? Sure. So in this case, you would get a non-unital, yes? Spectral triple. That's right, so very good. So it's... It be C0, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compact or... In fact, what you... No, compact is not a good idea, actually. It's, um, it's Schwarz functions that you typically would take. You're completely right, yeah. And also uh, the Dirac uh, does not have uh, a compact resolver, yes? That's right, but but in fact, there's um, that's not so much of a, of a problem. So let me first write Schwarz functions here. That's very important. Because if you're in the non-unital case, then that condition, this one, is actually replaced. By localized version. By localized version, exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's an A in front, and that one should be compact. And then in this case, that's actually the case. It's actually even better because these swatch uh, functions, if you deform them, they will be compact operators. So it's already satisfied trivially. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So the deformation you. makes these, I mean, this is also the connection to, I think later in the week, there will be a talk about this, where you re uh, realize, I mean, this is also quite well known, but if you realize this Moyal plane or this, this deformation with the star product, as uh, you can realize them as, as matrix, well, as infinite dimensional matrices, but this is actually due to the fact that this uh, this algebra is isomorphic to the compact operators, like in quantum physics. I mean, quantum physics is, is essentially if you take X and P, if you deform them, then what you end up with is the compact operators on the L2 space. And that's, um, that's the idea. Okay, thank you, I see. Okay, thanks. By the way, I should nuance this, what I just said, because uh, I said they were, they were compacts, but then of course I should do a polarization of the Hilbert space. So in fact, I, um, one should probably be a little bit careful here because the Dirac operator does not act on the polarized Hilbert space, which is kind of half the dimension, but it acts on this, uh, this d-dimensional space. So I think you still, still need to, the resolvent to, um, to, to be in place to have compact resolvent locally. But uh, probably Reimar and Harold can uh, either confirm or object. Okay, so my first question is: uh, so the set, the examples you presented, um, if I understand, do I, do I understand why it's a way to describe the degrees of freedom in gauge series or in the standard model? But there's no Lagrangian so far. That's correct. Yeah, not so, not yet. So I will come to that. Okay. And even though, I mean, I, I, I won't uh, explain, and maybe I will touch upon it, that it's possible to construct a Lagrangian from this starting point. And then, uh, in fact, there's another component that I didn't describe yet. So this I would like to do first is that there are no gauge degrees of freedom yet. It's just that I have this algebra sitting there, I have Hilbert space, 
But what I would like to have is that this Dirac operator gets coupled to gauge fields. So that, is, that it becomes a twisted Dirac operator, which then describes the gauge field content uh, for it. So I, what I put now as an ingredient is essentially this algebra that captures some kind of, well, we'll see in a moment that it describes the gauge uh, degrees of freedom, as in what kind of transformations are allowed, unitary transformations. And then uh, this Hilbert space, that describes the fermionic particle content. But what it will derive by general principle for all these examples is a kind of a fluctuation of this Dirac that is given by, this fluctuation is given by the gauge fields for each of these models. And that's why I could call them young males or standard model or Patisalam or whatever model you're interested in. Hope this answers that question. Um, the first, yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, so if you look at deformation quantization of symplectic or Poisson manifolds, um, even for say cotangent spaces or even a fine, uh, affine symplectic spaces. Can you build a spectral triple using these, um, these deformation quantization algebras? Uh, no, not in general. So it's, uh, there are some examples where this works. There's also classes of examples, um, but typically um, one has to kind of, uh, um, so let's see, what is the most general thing? Um, so for instance, this Moyal plane, it falls into the class of examples of Rival quantization, where there is some kind of action of RD um, that, that kind of takes care of the, the, the quantization of the deformed product. And as long as this Dirac operator commutes with that action, then you can always write down such a, a spectral triple. But it's kind of um, a very special case because it's, first of all, it's an isospectral deformation. It means that the spectrum of D and also the open space, they're the same. So nothing there changes. So in that sense, they're also isospectral. And the only thing that changed was this algebra that became non-commutative. So this can be an action of RD. It can be an action of a torus. So there are several uh, possibilities um, that, that one can consider. And then uh, when the structure is invariant with respect to that action, then it's actually possible. But more generally, um, there's only kind of cases that you could consider, like uh, examples, uh, very specific ones uh, where there's a Lie group symmetry or quantum group symmetry that, that uh, allows you to construct such a spectral triple. But there's no general recipe. And in fact, even the Poisson case, uh, even though there's a formal deformation, it's not so clear how to extend that to a sort of a, a setting where there are operators involved. So they're like um, bounded operators, Caesar algebraic quantization. That's already kind of a challenge. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, let's look at, um, at symmetries of spectral triples. Getting back to the general case. So, so now I'm in the in the general situation where I have A, H, and D. And I would like to know what uh, what is the natural notion of a symmetry. So already we discussed something like um, isometries yesterday, but it's actually um, it's, it's the most natural thing to do in this context where you have an algebra acting on the Hilbert space in a sort of a star uh, manner compatible with the star is to talk about unitary transformations or unitary invariance, which is defined as follows. So you have, um, so let me define it like this, the definition of unitary equivalence, you have A1, H1, D1, and you have uh, H2, sorry, A2, H2, D2. And they're unitary equivalent if there exists. So this means there is a, an alpha from A1 to A2, which is a star isomorphism. And there's a unitary operator U from H1 to H2, 
that kind of intertwines all the data. So it means that um, alpha of uh, A is actually U A U star and D2 is U D1 U star. So these are the two kind of properties that you that you have. So you intertwine the set um, by this, um, this, this relation, this unitary equivalence between these two. And then you say they are actually equivalent. And <clears throat> so that's um, kind of the, the notion of, of equivalence, which is rather strict. So soon I will kind of make it a little bit more flexible, uh, especially because that would be more interesting um, for the, for the non-commutative case. But to think about symmetries, this is actually quite useful. So maybe good to think about a special case of this. This will always be the, the thing. I have in mind is that you could, of course, uh, look at um, the case where A1 is A2 is A and H1 is H2 is H, and then take unitaries in the algebra to do this, this kind of intertwining. So take a unitary U, so these are unitaries, so I mean U star U, it's just an element in the algebra which is equal to the identity. So that uses the star, of course. Then you see what happens to this, uh, this alpha. So alpha of A, let me just write what it should do. It should be U A U star. So this is a special type of, uh, that's for all A and A, of course. There's a special type of, um, of automorphism and it's called an inner automorphism. So that's um, actually, it, it means that this alpha, it, it, it's, it's called alpha U of A. It means that there, there's a way to embed the unitaries into the inner automorphism, the inner automorphisms of, uh, of A. Actually not into, so let me make this correct. So it's two because there's a kernel. Okay, so you can map unitaries to the inner automorphisms, which are a subgroup. Actually, it's a, a normal subgroup of the automorphisms of A. And what you what happens to this D? So there's a single D, uh, or there's a D to start with. That's D one. Let me say D one is equal to D. That's what. Let's see what happens to D two, which is an is a Dirac operator or an operator on the same H, but it could be different in that. If you think what happens, u d u star, it's not necessary that that u commutes with d. So as it didn't commute with these elements in the algebra, there's no reason to expect that. So and what you can do, and since u is unitary, I can write this as u d u star added as a fluctuation to d. So it's u d u star, which means let me just do this very basic. computation. It's uh, the commutator, which is bounded by assumption. So I can do this computation. It's u d u star minus u u star d, but this is just the identity. So it means that what I end up with is u d u star. So this means that um, that to conjugate d with the unitary in the algebra, I can actually see that as a, as a bounded perturbation of d and this, this perturbation. So that's a bounded self-joint symmetric. Uh, operator that perturbs D. And if you think uh, in terms of physics, this is what people call a pure gauge field, okay? Because it's, 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 um, it's obtained by this unitary transformation. So it's a pure gauge field. And it's also the form that you find in, uh, in, 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 in say uh, the examples. Let me actually do one example. Um, let's look at um, the young Mills case, but in combination with the manifold, so it gets more interesting. So it's C infinity of M times M and C. Then uh, it's L2 of SM tensor CN, and then there's DM. 
And actually, let me just uh, keep it at dm and take the other one to be zero. So that's very important for this uh, specific. Um, so it's this common this construction of an almost commutative manifold where the finite part is Young Mills. Then first of all, let's see what uh, what this unitary group is. So this unitary is in the algebra. So they're actually um, so they're the algebra is functions which are pointwise uh, on M with values in the matrices. So if I impose them to be unitary, I just say there should be unitary in each point. So what happens is that these are maps from M, smooth maps from M into the unitary group. That's the ordinary U of N. So these are kind of unitary gauge transformations on a manifold M. So you start to see now already how this could be anything uh, related to um, gauge fields in, in physics. If you compute this for such a, a unitary, so this perturbation that I, uh, that I wrote down here, is then realized that this one here is something like gamma mu, Namla mu, and then uh, on some, some spinner bundles, on some, some Clifford um, or spin connection. But this commutator, it only sees this first uh, order part uh, of, of, of this one. So it only sees the partial derivatives. So this means that this one becomes something like u, and then d mu, u star, and then there's gamma mu in front. But it means that um, that this thing here, that's an actual pure gauge field as you would uh, see it in physics. And for instance, if I write u as uh, e to the uh, i x or something like this, of course locally, um, then then I could even write this as uh, something like gamma mu x. So it's a kind of a full derivative. And um, now the idea is that, uh, so there, of course there's a, a lot of things I, I put under the rug because this formula would work in the, in the abelian case, but let's, um, let's, let's keep the idea that we have a pure gauge field situation when I apply this unitary transformation to my uh, Dirac operator DM. Okay, so that's uh, sort of um, a hint of gauge theories from this uh, from this uh, non-cumulative setup so let's try to arbitrary case fields see what we can do what is was there a question not then I'll continue. So that's um, so. What we're after is to extend this formula over here to allow arbitrary kind of uh, perturbations or gauge fields. And so, as I said before, I mean symmetries of spectral triples. There, uh, they could be this considered to be this. But let's look at um, another type of symmetry that you could have on the level of algebras. Because as you may know, if you have a non-commutative algebra, there may not be so many um, star uh, homomorphisms even between two different uh, kind of different matrix algebras, if you wish. So maybe one example is, um, so if you have, let's see, if you uh, take uh, M2C and you try to map that to M3C, there's not so many possibilities to do that. In fact, there's none in a unital manner. So I need a little bit more general notion of symmetries between algebras. Because of the fact that star uh, isomorphisms or star homomorphisms are kind of a bit meager and too kind of classical, they're really geared towards the, the commutative case. This is more suitable for non commutative case. But they should have extend, of course, what we know in the commutative case. So that's something to keep in mind. 
and let's uh, let's try to do that. So the notion I'm after is Morita equivalence. So and the example is maybe this. So if you have M2C and M3C, it's a good exercise to try to find maps, star algebra maps, which are unital from M2C to M3C. It's a, and as I just said, this is not possible. So, and, and even though that, okay, that could be the end point. I mean, it would be more natural to have something like a map which does exist because this is actually the general situation that there are, this, if you look at the space of such maps, then just taking star homomorphisms could be just a little bit too, uh, too meager to, uh, to consider. And Morita equivalence, that's the more natural uh, thing to do. So, it's also telling me something about, uh, so of course, Morita was after uh, sort of an equivalence of representation theory. So you have like a category of representations of, of one object or one ring, try to connect it to the other one. And if they, these categories are uh, equivalent, then you could call these rings Morita equivalents. And in fact, it's just the same uh, thing we're after, but we do it more concretely by using the, the language of modules. So I'll restrict to unital, unital star algebras, and I will introduce this notion of Morita, Morita equivalence between A and B. And um, in such a way that actually, if these A and B are commutatives, then two of these uh, commutative star algebras are Morita equivalent if and only if they're star isomorphic. So that's the notion we're after. And what happens is that we need um, modules, by modules. So it means that it's a vector space E, which carries a left representation of B and a right representation of A. So it means that uh, you could just consider them as, as, as elements of B acting as algebra maps on the left and uh, on the right uh, from, for E, uh, for A, sorry. And then the other way around, of course, this is symmetric, it's an equivalence. There's an F that's also a bi-module, but then for A acting on the left and B acting on the right. So this means B acts on E on the left and A, that's what this notation is supposed to suggest on the right. And the other way around for F, then <clears throat> what you can do is you can, um, you can take their tensor products you can balance it over A, so it's linearized over A, so I can move elements of A linearly uh, over the tensor products. And then this is assumed to be isomorphic as a module to B, and the other way around, this is supposed to be isomorphic to A. And this is what Morita equivalence means. But the, the existence of these E and F in such a way that their tensor products, which are linearized over the corresponding uh, algebras that act, if they give me all of B and the other way around, if the other way around gives me all of A, then we call a Moritz equivalent to B. And some examples oops, is that if we have, um, commutative A and B, then we have that A is Morita equivalent to B, if and only if A is star isomorphic to B. So we didn't lose anything in our passage uh, to the non-commutative worlds by taking Morita equivalence as a more natural notion of, uh, of star uh, isomorphism. But another uh, example, which is quite nice, is to think about what happens if I take um, E to be CN. I should be a little bit careful because I um, should see what I am doing here. So an A is, yeah, so this is, uh, is column vectors and F. Cn is row vectors, just to consider them in the sense that I want to multiply a column vector on the left with m and c. 
So that's a um, MNC action on the left. And of course, on a row vector, you can act on the right with the matrices MNC action on the right. And everything is linear. So the other thing, the C, is actually just uh, the, the linear the structure. So this means that my, I should check. So uh, B is then M and C and A is nothing but C. And my claim is that A and B are Morit equivalent. So C is Morit equivalent to M and C. For any N, <clears throat> given these E and F, and let me uh, check or sketch how this works. And let's hope I did this correctly because this is done on the fly. So CN, if you take a column vector and you tensor it over C, so just a usual tensor product, and you kind of take it with a row vector, then you know that you can always kind of generate all matrices in this way, at least considered as a, a module or bi module. Yeah. So you can do this in a compatible way to have uh, all the M and C. Now, if you do it the other way around, so C N, you take a row vector and you tensor it over M and C with C N. Then what you can do in a compatible manner with this product of M and C, as you know from linear algebra, I can multiply a row vector with a column vector using kind of the inner product that is the canonical one in this case, given that I have C N here. So the, uh, the standard one, I should say, uh, I get back to C because I can just take this inner product uh, and, and, and get my complex number C. And one can show that, uh, that this is precisely compatible with this, this balancing over M and C. But if you think a little bit about it, it just means that, uh, that I'm just uh, playing with the indices in this case. So nothing really happens. If you write it out, it just works out. So these are the two situations. So the conclusion is, that C is Morit equivalent to M and C. Okay, so, and that's what I mean when I say that Morit equivalence is somewhat more natural because for instance, in this example of F, M2C and M3C, they're actually now Morit equivalent to each other because one can show also, I mean, there's a lot of uh, details, of course, I'm jumping over, is that Morit equivalence is an equivalence relation and that means that I can pass from M2C to C and back to M3C, et cetera. So um, kind of the upshot is that, um, that matrices do not really um, kind of change this, um, this equivalence class uh, for multi equivalence. And in fact, in the, if you think about these endpoint spaces, which are non-commutative, it means that in this equivalence class, I could just work with these endpoints uh, as well. It's just that there is additional structure internally to the space, but Morita equivalence kind of washes this out and makes sure that you can pass from every M and C to C uh, without losing too much uh, information. And think about Morita again. I mean, so the equivalence of, of, of representations, that's really due to the fact that, uh, that if you are given some, something like a vector space, then I can build from that a representation of the kind of n fold, so the MNC uh, situation. So I can move from one to the other. Okay, so let's um, so that's a little kind of uh, uh, intermezzo on Morita equivalence. Nothing to do yet with the um, with the Hilbert space or with the um, with the Dirac operator on a spectral triple. So let's see what happens if you kind of uh, move um, from A, let's say, to B. And I'm given a spin geometry on A. So I'm giving a spectral triple on A, and I want to transfer to B uh, using this Morita equivalence, the data that I was given. So let's see how that works. So transfer. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so coming back to this, the original definition of Morita equivalence that you gave, uh, how does one see for example, so the statement is that if two algebras are uh, Morita equivalent, then the category representations are equivalent. Is that the statement? That's right. Yeah. And how do we see that from the definition? Yeah, it's a very good question. So let's and let's look what happens. So if I have, um, say, I have a representation of uh, of A, and I want to move to a representation of B, 
then what I take is I take something like uh, so some some v some vector space with carrying a representation of a, and what I will do I will just kind of uh, take the tensor product of uh, sorry of um, let me get the right one it's e tensor v which is balanced over a. So you kind of use the the fact that a acts on the left, a representation for me would be kind of a left representation, just to make it simpler. So v is a, a represent a left representation of a. And what happens is that you kind of tensor uh, with the given bimodule e to turn it to, into a left representation for b. So this one I have here is a is a, is a b representation uh, with b acting on the left, and what I absorbed is the the action of A, uh, both, so balancing it over this tensor product between E and V. And that's how you pass from one category to the other one. And the, 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 the F you can use to go back, and that's an equivalence. So if it, I hope that um, that is more or less what you were asking. And um, yeah, so the fact it's an equivalence, it's, uh, it's a little yoga, but it's not hard that what you, what you seem to imply. That this it's, is an equivalent. The definition of the functors, I agree, it's uh, pretty natural. The fact it's an equivalence, one just has to think, or it's. Uh... No, but I mean, uh, in the sense that you have um, that you, that is an equivalence relation, or you mean if it's an equivalence of categories? If it's an equivalence of categories. Yeah, but then you take the the f, and the fact that f tends for e, as I wrote ah, here. Ah, okay. Yeah, I see. Okay. That's a. That's Thanks. just then it's trivially absorbed. So also that is not too much uh, of a. Of well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe the, sort of converse, the converse implication is more difficult. Yes, this is a content of the Morita theorem. Definitely, sure. I mean, if this is what you were asking, I thought you were asking about how to get this to into equivalence. Equivalence, that's not too difficult, but to show that if you're giving an equivalence of categories to get to such a module, that's of course a completely different story and, and much more involved. Yeah, very good points. Okay, so transfer uh, A H D to B H prime D prime. See what we can do if uh, B and A are multi equivalents. Okay, so that's kind of the task. That's the last thing I will do. Um, <clears throat> let me just hear from you. Uh, what's the time we should stop? Is it forty-five? Is it correct? Yeah. 45 should be fine. Okay. Um, so the idea is that, um, that of course, uh, I'm given now this, um, so I have this uh, E, which is actually sufficient, and it was an, a bimodule between B and A. So this is given to me, and uh, in fact, I take this to be, that's another kind of uh, somewhat deeper, It should be finally generated projective. So that's uh, another ingredient that's more of a technicality, which I also uh, jump over. Um, but that's always possible in this unital context. So what you do is you take H prime. You do exactly what I just uh, showed you to get from representations of A to representations of B. I take my Hilbert space H and I take the balanced tensor products where I use this A to get into B. And I take this A E in there. And that's my, at least it's a module for B. And then at the technical level, this finitely generates projectivity that I assume on E, which I can always assume. And yada, yada, there's a story and behind this, of course, is that um, this allows me to have a Hilbert space structure on H prime as well. But that's, uh, um, I mean, I take the luxury of the lecturer here for this mini course. And it's also not so relevant for the kind of the general picture. Then what I should do now, I mean, suppose I have this construction, I have this Hilbert space and I have this, uh, this, this, this E. In fact, it's, if it's finally generated projective, I don't even have to, to complete this. Uh, it's just, it's already Hilbert space as I wrote it. And the Hilbert space structure comes from, from H in combination with uh, some, some structure on E, but um, the completeness comes from H. So what I can do is I can, I can try to look at 
some operator that extends D to the tensor product. And D acts on H, that's how I started. So I just have to extend it to work uh, on this tensor product. But what I just wrote will never work because uh, so I know that D and the elements in the algebra A, they typically do not commute. So if I have this balancing taking place here, I can move freely these A's around. And this here, this, this formula here is not a good definition. You see, so I have to do something about this, um, this, this, this tensor uh, over A, where I can move freely with these elements in the algebra A. And only if A commutes with D, this would be a good definition. So suppose that's never the case, uh, or that's not the case, then, um, which is actually the, the, the usual situation. Then what you have to do is uh, you have to do something like a lift. So that will be this symbol that I will add. So I have to kind of lift to uh, the tensor products, my operator D, in a way that is compatible with this balancing. And this I do, this is D prime, using the connection. I mean, also that's something that you're quite familiar with. If you lift something like a derivative to a bundle, a vector bundle, you have to do something like that. You have to take a connection and um, there you have to choose a connection on E in this case. So this means that lambda goes from E into E. And now I have to kind of specify what kind of connection. So what kind of forms do I get? So there's a few um, kind of ingredients that I introduce along the way. So these are the kind of things I'm after. So I have to have um, this connection for the derivation D commutator with, uh, with an element. So this is a derivation because it's taking a commutator with D and I'm taking a, a lift of that to E, what is AJ and BJ are in A. And I will just show you that it actually works. So this is what I mean when I say it's a connection for the derivation which means that there is a Leibniz rule of this type. Okay, so there's a Leibniz rule telling me that I'm lifting this uh, D commutator with A uh, to my uh, E, and of course A is in A, to my, my, my module A, or E, sorry. Um, and what, is, what this means, this, this symbol, is that I take E tensor A. And as I started with, I take indeed E tensor D, uh, sorry, D psi. There's an element in the Hilbert space. So I take E tensor D psi, but this didn't kind of work with the balancing. So I have to add this numla E times psi. So that additional term, will allow me to show that it's actually uh, well-defined if I balance it. And um, maybe just, let me just uh, maybe uh, check that. So just quickly, so E A tensor Psi, this is E A tensor D Psi plus Delta E A Psi. And if I have the A on the other leg, then I get E tensor D A Xi. But this here is E tensor D commutator A Xi plus E A D Xi. So this is, I mean, what I'm after, this is kind of the balancing. And just to, have to make sure, so you can also read of what is the rule for this numla is that these um, and this, should be, uh, should be the same. So they satisfy this, uh, this rule so that I can again write this as one tensor number D, but then uh, on the other. And I'm missing one term here, sorry for that, which is of course, numla E takes uh, 
Yeah. So you read off from this what should be the rule, and then um, then you just fill in, or you realize that that's precisely the Leibniz rule. But this is actually a computation that you could also do for for vector bundles. It's the same thing. And so the final result that one can show is that if a h d is a spectral triple. And so it's B, A, and then one tensor around by D as well. And there's an additional kind of structure that you could uh, include of, of gradings and so on. This could all uh, this could all work. Now let's um, let's 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 end last two minutes. So with um, with the case of uh, self with the self equivalence, and I will stop. So this is an interesting situation that um, that that kind of comes back to this unitary equivalence. Is when you take B to be A and E to be A as well as a bimodule over itself. So with A acting on the left and the right, but just using the the, the multiplication, then you may wonder, so, okay, uh, what happens is that um, that I still have this possibility of, of mapping D into one tensor nomla D. And this is actually such a map is determined by what it does on one. And let's write this as omega. Which is just one of these elements in these differential forms that I was writing down. Is that this one tensor lambda d is now given by d plus omega, where I'm just adding now a term of the type aj dbj to it, which is considered to be differential one form. Uh, associated to the derivation uh, given by the commutator with D. And it's also called the con differential one form to kind of connect to where it first appeared. So con differential one form, and it generalizes the pure gauge fields that I was having before. Where you take AJ, U, BJ, U star. So you get exactly these back but now in a much more general uh, situation. And it's now the possibility to get into, uh, into kind of fluctuations of D by adding these kind of one forms of this type, uh, which are driven by Morita self equivalence as the more natural kind of equivalence that you get between these algebras or from the algebra to itself. And the, the main point, and that's probably also the starting point of uh, one of the talks or the first talk, uh, which starts in about, 15 minutes, I guess, is that um, that if you would apply this to young males, is that uh, you can compute that this omega of D for the MNC situation for kind of non-degenerate D, this is actually isomorphic to MNC. So what it means is that if I start with some D, which is a Hermitian matrix of, of size N, I do these fluctuations and I apply this D plus omega, I just compute what I get. I can get any other matrix in there, which will lead to me to the to consider the N by N emission matrices. And that's the starting point also for these matrix models, because this would be kind of the, the Gaussian uni unitary ensemble that, um, that was the starting point of the other talk. But that's kind of how to get to this ensemble or to get at least to the kind of the set of these matrices on which we are then going to kind of introduce uh, an action function. But for now, this is my endpoint, and I will uh, pick this up uh, on Thursday, maybe with a small recap, uh, and then to really get into functionals that we associate to kind of give me some kind of action principle for this omega that, that are supposed to be kind of taking care of the dynamics and the interactions that are um, performed by this omega. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Are there questions here from the audience or remote?
I have a question about yeah. this Yukawa uh, coupling matrix. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know much uh, about physics. So, uh, but uh, usually in physics, uh, one has to deal with units. So this uh, this matrix is, is expressed uh, in uh, in dimension uh, with respect to dimensionless constants or or what? Yeah, so I mean, in principle, uh, I mean, already my D should have uh, kind of um, dimension, right? I mean, it's like uh, the operator D uh, at the moment you you think about it, it's uh, in mathematics, it's just some integer spectrum. But in, in physics, there would be some kind of uh, dimension involved. So there's a natural passage to get from, uh, so uh, for instance, in the action functional, one takes care of this by um, by having d to have dimension of mass, but it should be counted because I'm I'm applying a mathematical principle by introducing some kind of mass scale uh, to uh, to get into numbers like uh, an integer spectrum, for instance. But that's how one can connect to this. But it's true that uh, that one and the actual kind of connection to the particle physics models is done uh, at the point where you have, where you look at an action functional and you identify it with the ones that particle physicists would write down. And then you make kind of the connection between the two and you get relations for these mass uh, couplings and so on. And also the coupling constants. I mean, it applies to everything. Also coupling constants, they should uh, have some kind of mass typically um, or mass dimension. So that's... Uh, Okay, but uh, uh, here we agree on the convention that uh, the speed of light is one and the Planck constant is one, or? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about all this. Uh, okay. It's completely fine to think about it like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. It's, it's more or less like that. So that at that point that you kind of, I mean, even if you uh, would read a theoretical physics book, there's also no kind of uh, notion of actual energy and so on, because exactly what you're saying, that you work in these units. But once you do the, the kind of uh, the, the connection, then one has to kind of uh, remember how this uh, transfer works. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, more questions? So, okay, uh, everyone seems happy. Um, yeah, Walter, thanks a lot. So, well, this is oh, for, for the other participants. In when I was very young, uh, this was my my topic, and I would say you made a much better introduction than what I had 